For this lab, we're going to observe the physical properties of nine different substances so that we can determine the type of bonding that exists in each. They're either going to be ionic or covalent. The first thing that I want to do is observe the properties, color and texture. I'm going to prepare uh, my elements, or not elements, I'm going to prepare my substances uh, so that I can determine their melting point after I observe their color and texture. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a piece of wire gauze and I am wrapping it in aluminum foil. This will allow me to heat the substances on a surface that's not going to burn up. Okay, so I have my aluminum foil wrapped around my wire gauze. Now I'm going to take a Sharpie and I'm going to make a tic-tac-toe board which will give me nine squares to put each of my substances in. And I can then label my substances. If I were to number my substances in my lab one through nine, I can then uh, have these squares numbered so that I can keep, keep track of my substances. So I have my squares numbered. Next, I want to distribute my substances on this grid. The first substance that I have is paraffin. Paraffin is the more technical term for wax. I only need a little bit. So this wax has actually been shaved with a grater. So that's why it has that texture to it. To avoid cross-contamination, I'm going to wipe off my micro spatula with a paper towel. In between, in between all transfers. So the next one I have is magnesium sulfate, known as Epsom salt. Next, I have potassium chloride. Next, I have urea. This one is in the ball form, so I have to be careful that these don't roll all over the place. I need to scoop them into a pile. The next one is table salt, sodium chloride. Table salt does often have different components, such as sodium iodide as well, but it's mainly sodium chloride. Next, I have sucrose. This is just common table sugar. It is a disaccharide of glucose. There's my sucrose. Next up, uh, I'm going to have nitrogen. Nitrogen is more of a hypothetical uh, substance in this case because nitrogen has a melting point of negative 210. It's composed uh, I mean, the air that we breathe is composed of 78% nitrogen, and so I could say that nitrogen is on that square as a sample, um, but of course it is in the gas phase. The next sample that I have is aspirin. This is typically in the tablet form, uh, but it needs binders to stay in the tablet form. 
um, by itself in a pure substance. It is a powder. And then my last sample is dodecyl alcohol. Dodeco alcohol is not the easiest to get out. It's kind of sticky. All right, there's my sample of dodeco alcohol. So I have my nine samples. We need to record the color and texture of each sample. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to establish a melting point of all of these substances. I'm going to test first if these will melt at 100 degrees Celsius. To get these samples to exactly 100 degrees Celsius, all I have to do is take a little bit of water and boil it. Since water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, if the water is boiling, then it is at 100 degrees Celsius and it's not rising beyond that. So I'm gonna add a little bit of distilled water to the bottom of a beaker. I don't need a lot because if I use too much, it'll take forever to boil. So I'm gonna let that boil. While that's boiling or when, when that's heating up, I'm going to set up a ring stand and a burner. Setting up my ring stand and burner is very simple. I'm just going to plug my burner into, well, into the, the attach it to the gas jet, turn on the gas. I'm gonna make sure the valve is open a half turn. The gas is flowing through the burner. I'm going to light it, get an orange floppy flame. This flame is not the right temperature for this lab. We want a temperature of roughly 500 degrees Celsius so that we can determine if it melts between 100 and 500. We determine if it melts at 100 by putting the samples over boiling water. We determine if it melts above 500 to see if it, uh, or we determine if it melts between 100 and 500 to see if it uh, melts over a burner that's at 500 degrees Celsius. To get a burner that's at 500 degrees Celsius, all I have to do is adjust my flame so that it is blue with no inner blue cone non-luminous, no inner blue cone, that's at roughly 500 degrees Celsius. So I will shut that off as I'm waiting for my water to boil. Now that my water is boiling, I'm ready to place my samples over the boiling water. The steam that's being produced should be just under 100 degrees Celsius. So I need to be careful moving my samples since, especially because the, the urea may roll around. And I'm going to place this right on the beaker. I can see number one, the paraffin is starting to kind of come together and what it's doing is melting. You can see number nine's already melted. It's still a little puddle. To avoid any problems of it running around and dissolving the other ones, I'm going to try to dab it with the paper towel to soak it up and get it off of there since it's already melted. No need in keeping it on there. Okay, I've removed the dodecyl alcohol since it already melted. definitely see the wax starting to puddle up a little bit. Floating around. I'll try to soak that one up as well. No point in having it stay on there. You know it melts. not seeing any action from the other ones so we're ready to move this to the burner my burner is already preset 
So I just need to put it under where I want to place my substances. I burnish presets. So I'm just going to put it under where I want to place my substances on the ring. I'm going to carefully transfer my samples. Those are hot. I'm going to use some tongs. I'm going to carefully transfer my samples using some tongs. Move them over to my ring stand. And I'm going to light my burner. So I'm going to turn on my gas. It's already preset to be 500 degrees Celsius. And I want to make sure the height of the flame is good. And it is. I see some activity for number eight. Number eight is starting to melt. Number eight is completely melted. See my alcohol running from nine to six, getting some of the Sharpie into number six. If I look carefully for number four, Number four is starting to decompose a little bit. Urea smells terrible when it's decomposing. I'm sorry that you can't smell this at home. If I continue to watch my samples two, three, five, and six, I'm waiting to do something. Four, melted, it's decomposing. Eight, melted already. So I'm watching two, three, five, and six. The urea is starting to boil. Again, it smells great. I'm starting to see a little bit of action on number six. It's starting to melt a little bit. I'm gonna soak up this urea so it stops boiling. You can see it's still smoking and decomposing. Meanwhile, our sucrose over here is continuing to melt. However, I don't see any activity from two, three, or five. Knowing from experience, I know that two, three, and five will not melt, and so we can go ahead and shut this down for the sake of time. Six melted, four decomposed and melted, eight melted, nine melted, one melted as well. If our samples melted over the boiling water, then we know that the melting point must be between room temperature, roughly 25 degrees Celsius, and the boiling point of water, 100 degrees Celsius. If they did not melt over the boiling water, then the melting point must be greater than 100 degrees Celsius. If our samples did not melt over the boiling water, but they melted over the 500 degrees Celsius flame, then we know that the melting point must be between 100 degrees Celsius and 500 degrees Celsius. If the sample did not melt over the 500 degrees Celsius flame, then we know that the melting point must be beyond 500 degrees Celsius. The next thing that I want to do is determine the solubility of my samples in water. And then if they do dissolve, I want to check their conductivity with a conductivity tester. For my conductivity tester, I can see there are different levels of conductivity ranging from low or none to very high, depending on the combination of the red LED and the green LED. First, I'm going to take some distilled water and I'm going to add it to the beaker. 
and I'm going to check the conductivity of pure distilled water by itself. So when I test the conductivity of the pure water, we can see that there is no conductivity for pure distilled water. The LEDs are not lighting. Next, I want to take a little bit of each of my samples and I want to see if they dissolve in roughly two milliliters of distilled water. When I'm doing this, I want to make sure I am taking the smallest sample possible so that I could determine if uh, it's actually dissolving. Because if I have too much of the sample, then some of it might dissolve and some of it might not dissolve because there's not enough water to dissolve all of it and I won't be able to ultimately determine if it dissolved or not. So I need to take a small sample to determine if it actually dissolved. And so my first sample is going to be paraffin. Again, I want to take the smallest sample possible. I have just one flake of paraffin. And now I'm going to take two milliliters of water using the calibrations on the side of my pipette. I'm going to take a stopper, stopper the test tube, and I'm going to shake it vigorously to determine if it's going to dissolve. And if I look carefully, I can see it's floating on the top and it has not dissolved. And so if it did not dissolve, there's no point in testing its conductivity, so I can move on. We could dump that into a waste beaker, rinse it with water a little bit, just to make sure I'm clearing that out for the next sample. Okay, so we'll let that one dry a little bit right there and my next sample is going to be Epsom salt. And so if I take my Epsom salt and I want to get the smallest sample possible, I just want a few granules of Epsom salt. Wipe off my micro spatula. I have just a little bit of the Epsom salt in the bottom of that test tube. And I want to take two milliliters of water and I want to try to dissolve my Epsom salts. I'm going to put a pipette. I mean, I'm going to put the stopper on the test tube and I'm going to shake it to dissolve. And if I look closely, I could see that this sample has dissolved. I do not see the sample in the water anymore. I do see some air bubbles, but I don't see any of the salt. So since it dissolved, I can now test the conductivity by pouring it into a little weighing boat. It'll fit right in there. I want to rinse my test tube so that there's no contamination for the next test. Rinse it out into the waste beaker flip it over to dry, and now we can test the conductivity of my Epsom salt in solution. So I want to put the two prongs in, and I can see that I have the red light, and it is glowing probably, I'd say, medium. So we have a medium glow from the red, and if I look carefully, there's no glow from the green. Okay. So I want to dump that into my waste beaker. I could rinse that with a little bit of water, get rid of any contamination. And I'm ready for my next sample. So my next sample is potassium chloride. Again, I want to take the smallest sample possible. Off my 
micro spatula. You can see that I have a small sample in there. And I want to add two milliliters of water. Add the water, stopper the test tube, and shake. And if we look carefully, we can see that this sample also dissolved. And so now I'm going to test its conductivity. I'm going to dump it in the weighing dish. I'm going to rinse out my test tube into the waste speaker, flip it over to dry, and now I'm going to test the conductivity of what sample was that? Potassium chloride. And so put my indicator conductivity tester in there and I have a bright red LED lighting up. Wipe off the prongs. I'm going to dump the wing boat into the waste speaker. I'm going to rinse this with a little bit of water to make sure I don't have any contamination for my next sample. and I'm ready to move on. My next sample is urea. So I'm going to take my test tube and I'm going to add, I'm gonna just add, try to get one of these little balls of urea. They're very difficult because they tend to roll away. Put that in my test tube. Can you see that? it right on the side of the test tube there and when I add water to it I can get it in the bottom next I'm going to stopper the test tube and I'm going to shake to see if it dissolves If I look carefully, I could see that the urea has dissolved. So now I'm gonna test its conductivity. Throw it in the weighing dish. I'm going to rinse out my test tube with some water. And now I'm going to test the conductivity. So, the connectivity and we see that it does not light the LEDs therefore it does not conduct. I'm going to dump out my Wang dish into the waste beaker. I'm going to rinse it. Moving on to my next sample. My next sample is table salt. I'm going to get a small amount of table salt. Going to get some water from my table salt. I could see that the table salt is kind of stuck to the side of the test tube. I'm going to add my water while trying to wash it down. It won't matter too much because I'm about to shake it. Add my stopper and I'm going to shake. Try to free up some of those bubbles. If we look carefully, we could see that the table salt has dissolved. 
Now I'm going to test its connectivity, port in the wing boat, rinse out my test tube for the next sample. And I'm going to test the connectivity. So you can see that we have a bright red LED lighting up. And if you look carefully, you can also see that it's a dim green LED lighting too. So that one definitely connects. We pour that into the way speaker. We're going to rinse it with a little bit of water to avoid contamination. for my next sample. My next sample is sucrose. I'm going to get a small amount of sucrose. Remember small amounts are key. If I look carefully I can see that I have the sucrose in there. It's all stuck to the sides. I'm then going to add my water, two milliliters of distilled water. I'm going to stopper my test tube and shake. Shake to dissolve. If I look at my sample, I can see that it has dissolved. We do see some air bubbles on the side of the test tube but those are not the sugar. We're going to then dump this in the weighing boat to test the connectivity. I only have three more samples or two more samples after this, so I'm not gonna bother rinsing those anymore. So I'm gonna go to test the connectivity. And when we test the connectivity, we see that the LEDs do not light. So I can dump my wing boat into the waste beaker. Still need to rinse the waste beaker. I mean, I still need to rinse the wing boat. And my next sample is nitrogen. Uh, I know that nitrogen is not going to dissolve in water because um, water has no nitrogen content. And then on top of that, I know that nitrogen doesn't conduct doesn't conduct uh, electricity. Um, that's why I can't very easily charge things wirelessly without magnets. So for nitrogen, I could put that. It's not soluble in water and it doesn't conduct. And then the next one is going to be aspirin. I'm going to take a sample of my aspirin. I want a small amount. I have the aspirin in the test tube. I'm going to add the distilled water. Stop with the test tube and shake. And if we look carefully, we could see the aspirin floating around in the water. It did not dissolve, so it's not soluble in water. So since it's not soluble in water, I'm not going to bother to test the connectivity. I'm going to rinse it into my waste beaker. I'm going to rinse out my test tube. Oh, actually I didn't need to do this because I have a test tube that's already rinsed out, but I'm going to follow through with it anyway. So I don't have a messy test tube. 
And then my last sample is dodecyl alcohol. So I'm going to take my dodecyl alcohol. I'm going to kind of scrape this into the test tube because it's kind of a sticky substance. My test tube is already wet, so this is not going to be perfect, but we'll manage. I'm going to take my two milliliters of water and I'm going to try to spray this into the bottom. I'm not doing a good job of spraying it in the bottom. My water is stuck in the top of my pipette. Let me get a little bit more water. Okay, well, this, the dodeca alcohol is stuck at the top. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of put my finger over it and I'm going to shake it that way. I'm gonna have to rinse my hands after this because I do not want dodeca alcohol on my finger. Shaking it and after shaking it for a while, if we look carefully, we can see that the water is cloudy and the dodecyl alcohol, the dodecyl alcohol is kind of sticking to the sides of the test tube. And so we have a strong indication that the dodecyl alcohol is not soluble in water. If it's not soluble in water, we do not need to test its conductivity. This is a hairpin, and we want to observe the qualities of the spring steel by trying to bend open. You can see the spring steel snacks, or snaps back into place. Next, I want to heat the hairpin. Let's turn off the lights. So what I want to do is I want to heat the part of the pin where the bend is and once I am able to make that a bright orange color I should be able to bend the pin open. So I want to heat in the hottest part of the flame. It's going to burn off some of the paint. It's bright red and I open the pin. So the pin has been opened. I want to straighten the other pins, so I'm going to heat them at the hottest part of the flame, get it bright red, weaken that bond, make it straight. I was a little bit more successful with that one, so I'll reheat this one. And then I want to do that for my third pin. Burn off the paint, get a bright red metal, and open it wide. So I now have three straightened pins. Next thing I want to do is I want to take all three of these pins and I want to heat them simultaneously in an effort to get them all red hot and I'm going to heat the pins and burning off the paint. I want to do this before the forceps get, forceps get too hot to hold. I want to get them all glowing red. Doing my best not to heat the forceps since metal is a conductor and it will conduct the heat straight to my fingers. And what I want to do is slowly cool these. And so to slowly cool them, I will begin to lift them out of the flame very slowly. The slower I cool them, 
the softer the steel will become. Okay, so I have my softened steel. I'm going to let these cool. Set my burner aside. I'm going to place a piece of paper underneath so I can better show you what's going on. That was hot. So we'll give some time for these to cool. I could check to see if these are cool enough to touch by approaching them with the back of my hand to see if I feel any warmth. I'll give it a quick tap. I can touch them and so they must be cool enough to bend. And so now I want to bend these into J's. And uh, remember that we had spring steel before and it snapped back into place. Now I want to take these and I want to see if I could bend them. And you could see that I am very easily bending it into a J and it is not snapping back into place. So I'm gonna make these into J's. You can see the paint from the hairpin is creating a mess, but that's okay. So I have three J's. For the next maneuver, I'm going to make hardened steel. So I will take two of these J's and I will heat them in the flame until they're glowing red all over. And then I will quench them in some cold water. By quenching them in cold water, I will make hardened steel. So I'll take two of my J's, get my burner back, and I'm going to heat these until they are bright orange as much as possible. I'm seeking to heat them in the hottest part of the flame, starting with the part that's furthest from the forceps first, so I'm not heating the forceps prematurely so I won't burn my fingers. So I'm doing my best to heat them. Almost dropped it there. Did drop it. And then when I'm glowing red like this, I want to quench it in the cold water. And I can see all of the paint came off, and I can take that out. So the rapidly cooled metal has made hardened steel. I'll do that once more. I will heat the J until it is bright orange. Quench it in the cold water. Ooh, I missed. Since I did miss my beaker, I'm gonna have to reheat it so it's bright orange again. And here we go for attempt two. Okay, so I have created two hardened steel J's. I'm going to set my flame aside once more. And now 
I want to try to straighten one of these. So when I go to straighten, I'm using a white background so you can better see what's going on. I'll try to straighten the pin and it breaks. So I try to straighten the other piece and the hardened steel is so hard that it's become brittle. It's no longer malleable. So that is hardened steel. I could do that with the other one, but I'm not going to. Next, I want to take the hardened metal and I want to temper it. And so what I could do is I could slowly heat it until it's an iridescent blue-gray color, but I don't want this to become hot enough that it's gonna become bright red again. So I just wanna heat it up to the point where it's gonna about to become that bright orange color, and then I want to not let it get hotter than that. Okay, so I'm going to take my flame, bring it back. I'm gonna shut the lights for this one as well. So I want to very carefully move this in the flame. I want to heat it just on the brink of getting that bright orange color. So this is tempering the steel. to slowly let it cool. So I'm not going to touch this to the table yet because the table will help cool it more rapidly. And as this cools, it's going to be tempered when it's all finished. I'm going to now lower this to the table to cool some more. I'm done with my burner, so I can shut this off. I can set that aside. I'll turn the lights back on. I want to compare the two colors of my just softened steel hairpin, that's a J, and then my iridescent blue tempered steel. So I'll try to bring these closer to the camera. And hopefully you could see that the one in the forceps is kind of an iridescent blue color, whereas the other one, the, the softened steel, is more of a, a gunmetal gray. So this iridescent blue one has been tempered. I can feel and see if it's hot. It's not hot. So it looks like I can touch this. And so now I'm going to take my tempered steel pin and I'm going to try to bend it okay so I'm try to bend it and it snaps back into position so, get it. so trying to bend my tempered steel it snaps back into position just like how it started see how it snaps back so I can bend it snaps back that's tempered steel compare that to the softened steel, so here's my softened steel one, I bend it, and it doesn't snap back. Softened steel, I could just bend it however I would like, it's not going to snap back into place, 
But the tempered one, on the other hand, is going to snap right back into place.